Uh, this webinar is the first of four in the TSRA Journal Club webinar series for this year, titled Lifetime Management of Aortic Stenosis. My name is Chi Chi Do Nguyen. I'm a current PGY3 I6 CT surgery resident at the University of Michigan and uh, TSRA Education Committee Chair for this year. Uh, joining us is Dr. Aziz, who will be moderating with me. <laughs> She's a current PGY2 I6 CT surgery resident at the Ohio State University and an active member of the Education Committee. Despite our football rivalries, we are here together um, to join you tonight for what will be a lively and engaging uh, discussion. So I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the panelists joining us tonight. First, I have the honor of introducing one of my fantastic mentors, Dr. Bo Yang from the University of Michigan. Dr. Yang is the Frankel Research Professor of Cardiac Surgery at the University of Michigan, Director of Aortic Surgery, Program Director of the Advanced Aortic Fellowship, Executive Director of My Aorta, and Director of the Thoracic Aorta Research Lab. He is the innovator behind the Y incision aortic root enlargement and has extensive experience in basic science research and clinical research within the field and lends his experience in tonight's discussion. Next, joining us from Emory University is Dr. Kendrick Grubb. Dr. Grubb completed a fellowship in interventional cardiology and transcatheter therapies after her uh, CT surgery fellowship and then became the director of minimally invasive cardiac surgery and the surgical director of heart valve program at the University of Louisville. She currently leads as the surgical director of the Emory Structural Heart and Valve Center and associate professor, where she has led and participated in multiple clinical trials of innovative cardiac surgery technologies. So we're really happy to have her here today. Thank you for having me. And then I will go ahead and introduce our next two panelists. So firstly, I have Dr. Marie France Poulin, who is an interventional cardiologist, as well as an associate director of structural heart clinical services at the BI. And she is also the associate director for the interventional cardiology fellowship at the BI. She was primary point of contact for Beth Israel during the recruitment period of the um, one of the upcoming trials we'll talk about, and is also one of the co-authors for our upcoming journal articles. She is also a cardiologist on a Zoom call with three attending cardiac surgeons, so she'll provide us a very um, great perspective. And then the final panelist I have to introduce is Dr. Michael Reardon. Um, Dr. Michael Reardon holds the position of the Allison Family Chair of Cardiovascular Research at Houston Methodist Hospital and Clinical Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the MD Cancer Center. He created his um, multi-institution, um, multidisciplinary cardiac tumor team at HMS and at the MD, Canderson, MD Anderson Cancer Center. And amongst his many roles, one of the a few of the ones relevant to tonight is that he served as the national serves as the national surgical principal investigator for the Evolute Intermediate Risk Trial, the Evolute Low Risk Trial, and the Evolute Thirty Four Millimeter Trial. Um, so, I'll just go ahead and thank you all for joining us today. Um, our discussion tonight will focus on surgical and transcatheter interventions in low risk patients with aortic stenosis. And the approval of TAVR low risk, low surgical risk patients was issued by the FDA on August 16th, 2019. However, our ever growing population and the longer life expectancy of our population requires innovative strategies for the lifetime management of aortic valve disease and multiple multidisciplinary discussions. So tonight, we will start with some discussion of uh, four articles, followed by two case presentations throughout. And we'll start off with Jenna with this paper here. Yes, so I will go ahead and quickly um, sort of summarize the three or outcomes after transcatheter um, or surgical aortic valve replacement in low-risk patients with aortic stenosis. So what this Evolute um, low-risk trial sort of sought to answer was this question, in patients with severe aortic stenosis but low surgical risk, is transcatheter aortic valve replacement non-inferior to surgical aortic valve replacement in regards to death or disabling stroke? Um, it was a multinational randomized non-inferiority trial with which consisted of 86 centers enrolling between two, the March 2016 and November 2016. Our population was 40, about 1,400 people 
730 who underwent TAVR and 684 who underwent SAVR. Um, and our STS risk analysis was less than 3%. In terms of intervention for TAVR, the valves used were either the core valve, Evolute-R, or Evolute-Pro. And for SAVR, patients received a bioprosthetic valve, um, which valve was at the choice of the, or the discretion of the operating surgeon. And in general, for our characteristics, the mean age at baseline was about 74 in both treatment groups. And the mean um, Society of Thoracic Surgeons predicted risk of mortality score was about two. And there were no significant baseline differences between groups. So sort of going on to the next slide, um, between years one and three, there were about 20 TAVR patients who exited the study and 28 patients in the surgery group who exited the study. Um, and so if you go and look at the graphs, I think we have to go to the next slide. There we go. Um, if you look at the graph on that left-hand side, um, so the difference in Kaplan-Meier time to event graphs rates for the primary endpoint of all-cause mortality or disabling stroke for TAVR and SAVR remain broadly consistent between time points. So at year one, we had a time point, of, <clears throat> we had um, a rate of 1.8%. 2% at year two and 2.9% at year three. And on the right-hand side um, in the top hand corner, we see that at three years, patients who received TAVR with a self-expanding superannular valve had a lower rate of death or disabling stroke compared to those undergoing surgery um, at a rate of 7.4% for TAVR and 10.4% um, for SAVR. Um, and then finally, in terms of quality of life, initially you see the curves um, diverge 30 days post-procedure. Post -proce However, at three years, both groups reported similar improvements in quality of life. And then a final slide on our graphs before I open up for a discussion. Um, it's just some of the echo results from the three or our three-year outcomes. So um, in general, patients on the TAVR group had significantly lower aortic valve mean gradient, nine millimeters in the TAVR, 12.1 millimeters in SAVR. And then um, they also had a mild paravalvular regurgitation was more frequent in the TAVR group. Um, however, there was no difference in the presence of moderate or greater paravalvular regurgitation. Um, so I think uh, the, the questions that Chi Chi and I wanted to ask and to have to understand as trainees was coming out of this study, what are some of the strengths and the weaknesses we should take away? Oh, and then we can go into the four year too. It just shows um, that the difference between treatment arms for the primary endpoints continues to increase over time. Um, but yes. So I will defer to Dr. Reardon. Um, he uh, has intimate knowledge of these uh, trial of this trial and the three and four year data, and so um, certainly his um, interpretation is what we heard on the podium and is what we've carried through. And then I think Dr. Yang and I can, um, and uh, Dr. Poling can comment on how we use this with our patients. Well, yeah, you know, we started when we looked at the at the three and the four year data to uh, look at what I thought was the fact that valve performance would, would uh, equal outcomes. And we previously looked, and we talked about this when we presented this, that we previously looked at the durability of Evolute versus surgery using kind of a modified part three definition of moderate or greater structural valve duration being an increase in your mean gradient of 10 millimeters or more from your last echo, discharge echo, to your current echo, and a final of 20 or more left off the decrease in EOA and DVI that VARC put in there. Now, remember, VARC has never been validated to clinical outcomes. VARC was put together by a bunch of experts sitting in a room. We just made something up. I, I was one of them. And we just figured we'd give you a definition. And when we did that, we showed that surgery had more moderate or greater structural valve duration than did, than did uh, Evolute. And if you got it, whether you had surgery or TAVR, it doubled your all-cause mortality, it doubled your cardiovascular mortality, and doubled your hospitalization rate. And Steve Yakovov came back and looked at overall valve dysfunction, which includes structural valve dysfunction, non-structural valve dysfunction, endocarditis, and thrombosis, and showed that there was more in surgery than there was in TAVR with Evolute, driven mainly by severe patient prostate mismatch and structural valve duration in surgery, 
no difference in thrombosis, uh, no difference in endocarditis, although it trended in favor of, of evolution to a 0.07 level. So we wanted to see what that would do to these endpoints. And this is, you know, we, we chose a primary endpoint of all cause mortality of disabling stroke, because when you go to low risk, there's gonna be less events. So you either have to have patients, time, or, or events. And Mike Mack and Marty Leon decided to add events and use all cause mortality, all stroke and hospitalization. Jeff Popman and I, Jeff was my PI at that time, John Force has taken over since Jeff works for Medtronic now, decided that we'd stick with a more conservative all-cause mortality disabling stroke because we were going to have to sell this to the surgical community. And hospitalization was kind of a, you know, you can decide to do that or not, but you can't decide if you're dead or if you have a stroke or not. And so one of the things I pointed out was we all know that TAVR has an early advantage in mortality, stroke, and recovery. The question is, will that hold up over time? Or once you get over the insult to surgery, will surgery catch up as we've seen in a lot of randomized trials? And here we see that surgery is not cut up, caught up at four years. And in fact, it's still widening in favor of TAVR. Now, you know, you didn't show, Gina, the, the slide, the next slide that we showed, we talked about this, we broke this down to all-cause mortality or disabling stroke. And this is driven mainly by all-cause mortality, 9% evolute and 11.4% surgery. 0.07, not significantly significant, but obviously trending in the right direction, you know, for TAVR. My personal feeling is that the slope of your mortality line is related to your intrinsic risk. If you look at high risk, the slope of the mortality line is steeper. As you go to intermediate risk, it's less steep. And you go to low risk, it's less steep. So each individual trial has a different population and a different slope. Now, whether the lines converge or diverge depends on the relative performance of the test valve, TAVR, versus the comparative valve surgery. And the, other, the last thing I'll say, and I'll turn it back over to Kendra and, and Bo Yang, uh, is that I was asked on the podium to compare between the trials. We cannot compare between these trials. I can't compare my TAVR valve to SAPIN, and I can't compare my surgical arm to their surgical arm. And attempts have been made to do that, saying they're the same population. They are not the same population. Even if the demographics look the same, we do randomized trials because we understand there's hidden confounders. And so be very careful to, to avoid people trying to draw direct comparisons between the trials. You can talk a little bit about the relative difference between the test and the comparator, but do not look at absolute numbers. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, and Dr. Reardon, while you're on that, one of the things that, um, you know, some of my own residents, I recently gave a morning lecture on this, and they were wondering why these trials were built as non-inferiority trials instead of superiority trials. Why did you decide to do that? And what does it mean? And then when you have a significant p-value, what does that mean? Yeah. So a, a couple of con. Okay, so first of all, industry puts together trials that they think they can win. And they thought they could win a non-inferiority trial, not a super, superiority trial. As you see, we haven't reached superiority here either, number one. Number two, we really don't have to be superior to surgery if you're a TAVR advocate. You just have to be grossly equivalent to surgery. And so, so people were happy with that. Now, there are a couple of comments. If, if you, there was a, an article that came out in the annals recently looking at trying to benchmark uh, the, the, uh, the outcomes from the STS for lowest trials. And in that, they talk about a, a paper that came out from the Integrity Group in JAMA that looked at all the lowest trials. And one of the things they pointed out is in all the lowest trials, this partner UK notion, there are three basic problems. One is that, is that loss to follow-up is a threat to your data integrity. And differential loss to follow-up is an even bigger problem. And in every lowest trial, there's more loss to follow-up in surgery than there was in TAVR. Number two, deviation from assigned treatment is a, is a problem with how you look at your data. And deviation from assigned treatment was all in all trials for, was greater in surgery than in TAVR. And extra procedures is an issue with your data. And that was more common in surgery than TAVR in all these trials. And it's exacerbated in non-inferiority trials. And the only trial that was low risk that was, that was superiority was Notion. And, and by being superiority, that, that helps mitigate some of these issues. But again, you know, the, the, the industry doesn't design trials that they want to lose. And, and so when we were putting this together, you know, non-inferiority was okay. The thing we have to be careful of with non-inferiority, and Kendra knows a lot more about this than I do, is that you can be numerically less and non-inferior. And if that becomes your new benchmark, the next trial, you can be numerically less and non-inferior. And the difference continues to creep out. Now here, we're not in fear, but we're numerically better. So that gives me some sort of confidence. But the trials where you see you're numerically worse and not in fear, 
that bothers you for each new trial because it can move further and further from reality. And and, and, I, and again, I'll, I'll defer to Kendra because Kendra, this is your your area. Well, we don't need to do a deeper dive and I appreciate your ex explanation because that's basically what I told the, the residents uh, when I presented as well. And it's a it's a difficult, it's a nuanced um, thing, but all of the trials have been designed on inferior and, and so, I think where we are right now, which getting back to um, Jenna's question, which you know basically is what do we do with this data at this time? Um, so you know, first, Bo, what do you what do you tell your patients right now? We've got midterm data. So yeah, before we jump on that, I just want to ask Mike here because you know you really need your data for this. You look at this curve in front of us. It's too deep, too too. <laughs> points is very, uh, you just jump out. Number one is the mortality in the first year, or first yeah. several months of surgical, just jump out that much. And uh, then if you eliminate that, just go from discharge to look at the, the uh, midterm outcome, the, the mortality on stroke is, surgery is still going up faster than Tava. And I want to ask, uh, Mike, do you have the, the data of the cause of the mortality? And you think many is mortality in the early stage, the first three months, and later on, do we have an explanation why, why uh, surgery didn't have this have more higher mortality uh, right after surgery within three months and gradually still high? Yeah. So uh, first of all, you're exactly right. I mean, a lot of this separation of the curve is from the first month. And so we, we've taken these at one year and, and landmarked them. And we've done that for both trials. And if you landmark this trial, they're, they're, they still separate, but the separation is not as impressive because you get rid of that one month. If you separate your landmark partner, you'll see they move in the other direction. Now, why does why does TAVR do better than surgery? Because TAVR in this, in this trial had better hemodynamics, less severe patient prosthetics mismatch, and less structural valve deterioration, all of which are associated with earlier mortality. And, and you know, if you put in a bigger surgical valve and have better hemodynamics, guess what? They do better. Remember, annular enlargements in these trials were used less than 5% mm -hmm. of the time. Now, one of the things I said, Bo, when I presented this was that I pointed out that fact that what we don't know if we did annular enlargements, what that would have done, that would require further study. But I have told Medtronic, they'll let me run the trial again. I think I can win. I don't haven't found any takers yet. But if they do, I'll call you and Kendra. <laughs> But it's it's a valve it's it's a valve performance thing. It's 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 hemodynamics and, and structural valve. And structural valve, we understand why Evolute one structural valve over surgery and why P three actually lost. If you really looked at the at the Philip Peebro's paper in the back when they did inverse probably treatment weighting, P three lost in years four and five, and it's because mm -hmm. the mean EOA for for uh, for an S three and Becky Hans was one point six six. The mean EOA of the surgical mm -hmm. valves was one point eight. And the mean EOA for, for Evolute was 2.06. Again, the bigger valve you start with, the better you do. I, I know somebody keeps telling me that all the time, and I believe. <laughs> well, Bo certainly believes that. He's taught us all how to do his Y incision yeah. and root enlargement to put two sizes bigger valves. Um, but Dr. Poland, you know, we're in this midterm, messy middle. What are you telling your patients with all of this data? No, that's that's a great question. So Honestly, I think this has been reassuring. This is making us feel that, you know, what reinforces that what we've been doing has been good. Still midterm data, right? So we need a little bit long-term data, but so far this has been reassuring. It tells us that, you know, Tavern Savers seems to be equivalent right now, or that's what we can tell from these trials. And I think we'll need a little bit more long-term data to make sure that, you know, the good data that we're seeing right now continues to be present at 10 years, but so far this is reassuring. And Kendra, I will say that I was asked this on the podium, and I pointed out several times that I've been doing this for 40 years. There's been several valves that I put in surgical valves that look great at the seven years. And the Toronto stainless valve, I thought that was going to change the world, started failing. Trifecta, I wrote my first early trifecta failure paper in 2017. I know Bo and your group wrote a paper after that. Both those are off the market now. And and and, and I will, I, mean, I, I say exactly what you said, Marie, is that, you know, this is this is encouraging. But this is a long way from definitive for any of these valves. And valve performance and, 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 and failure is not a class effect. It's an individual valve effect based on valve design and tissue science. So surgical valves will fail at different rates. Each tavern valve is going to be different. Yeah, I, and, I, and I, couldn't, 
I couldn't agree more. And that's what, you know, I've been trying to say is that each valve is going to have their unique thumbprint. They're going to have their unique hemodynamics, their unique pacemaker rates, their unique um, complications, some of which we're able to overcome. You can fix pacemaker rates, you can fix paravalvar leaks, but the inherent hemodynamics of the design of the valve frame and design of the leaflet that's intrinsic to the valve. And we learned that in surgery. As Dr. Reardon just said, we learned it kind of the hard way with some of the externally wrapped um, valves. And so I don't think we're at a place now where we should continue to keep talking about TAVR versus SAVR. It really is the individual valves and their performance. Unfortunately, the surgical arm is all thrown together. And so it's hard to then talk about which individual valve outperformed the others. And that's on us. That's on us as surgeons that we never did that work. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Because when we designed these trials, we actually talked about that, that, you know, having different surgical valves does muddy the water. But I would challenge any of you to get a group of surgeons together and say, decide on one thing. Uh, <laughs> it was just not in the, not in the it was, was it not possible to do valves? But I had surgeons that, that say that if we didn't just do all minimum invasive, the trial was not even a reasonable trial. And yeah, so no. it, was a, it, was, it was a very difficult thing. And, and it does muddy the water. And that is a limitation of, of the trial. I, I do agree with the Nobles, uh, Mike, and Kendra mentioned that the type of valves and also the sizes. And uh, I just want to briefly mention the, you know, um, what uh, we we did the studies. We will present the STS compare the Tava versus uh, Avalo the Sapien three versus uh, Sava with the enlargement adjusted the uh, Michael valve, and uh, actually with the enlargement um, short term, even two year two year short term uh, hemodynamics is much better, significant significantly better in the uh, Taba with the enlargement group. So we'll present this abstract at STS. Yeah. As I said, though, I think we could win the second time around, but nobody's taking me up on it. going to do it. <laughs> nobody's going to do it. Nobody can sponsor that. I'll ask mm -mm. The mm -mm. <laughs> Yeah. And so we were just talking about how there are different outcomes with uh, different Taber valves. Uh, specifically. So that actually lends way to the discussion of the next paper, which is transcatheter uh, AVR in low risk patients at five years. So this was done with the balloon expandable uh, CPN3. So the question here was the same thing um, evaluating TAVR and SAVR um, in low risk patients with symptomatic severe AS. It was randomized in parallel. Um, so the TAVR group, there were 503, and the SAVR group, there were 497. Uh, the TAVR group received aspirin and Flavix prior to the procedure and then uh, uh, over a month after the procedure as well. Um, this was something that I don't think uh, was uh, randomized to the SAVR um, group in this paper. Um, the total number of enrollees are 1,000. The mean age was 73, with 30% being female and 31% having diabetes. Um, so the inclusion criteria was symptomatic. Um, and high grade and then suitable for transfemoral access for the TAVR uh, patients. Um, STS risk had to be low, so less than four. And then the primary outcome was the same with all cause mortality, stroke and rehospitalization. So here with uh, the results, we see that same kind of comparable to the paper before TAVR uh, had similar results to SAVR at preventing death, stroke and rehospitalization up to five years. Um, mortality and strokes at five years was also uh, similar <clears throat> to surgery and TAVR with um, it actually closing the gap uh, a little bit at five years. Um, TAVR was also associated with a lower risk of AFib and a shorter hospital stay than SAVR um, with a long, longer improvement um, in quality of life in the beginning that then also trailed off to be uh, similar after that one year period after SAVR. Um, TAVR was associated with a lower incidence of AFib and serious bleeding when compared to SAVR. And then uh, SAVR was associated with a lower incidence of valve thrombosis and mild or greater paravalvular uh, regurgitation. So valve function seemed to be similar between the two groups. So again, this is um, also a landmark trial that helped expand the patient population, um, saying that TAVR and SAVR were comparable, but I think, again, it all comes down to um, the valve like you were talking about. And I think it's really difficult to make com comparisons between a TAVR group and SAVR group when SAVR really is just so um, all across the board 
in what type of valve we use, what technique we use uh, with the different surgeons that you were mentioning. And so uh, Jenna will then bring us to our case presentation so that we can have some more discussion. Um, yes, so in terms of our case presentations for our first case, um, we just have a 75 year old male with um, New York class one symptoms. He was found to have a murmur on annual health maintenance exam and his TTE revealed severe aortic stenosis. He swims um, five, oh, he swims a lot <laughs> um, without any symptoms and his BMI is 31. His past medical history is significant for aortic stenosis AFib on Coumadin, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and skin cancer. His past surgical history, vasectomy, skin lesion excision, and he smoked for about 27 pack years, but he quit 30 years ago. For our STS score, his mortality score is 0.7, and morbidity and mortality score is 5%. Um, and then here's a summary of our... Um, pre-op studies. Um, our EF is 55% and he's found to have a thickened aortic valve with severe AS, no AI. Um, he has a markedly dilated RA in left, a in left atrium and a dilated RV with mildly decreased function um, and mild MR, no TR. Um, on his calf, right dominance, normal coronaries, carotids are normal. Um, and he's found to be a rate controlled AFib. On a CT TAVR, um, he has a tricuspid aortic valve with a calcium score for about 4,813. And he has a high takeoff of his RCA from above the STJ. He has normal aortic diameters. Um, and then you can see his pre-op studies. He has minimal tortuosity in his um, femorals and his iliacs and minimal calcium throughout. Um, and then I will just leave this here for one second for everyone to take a peek. Um, and then go on to some of our questions. So what would be your procedure of choice in this patient and why? Um, with the same STS score, what factors would make you recommend um, the other? So I guess, what would you choose to do? And if you had to do the other one, what would, um, why would you do it? Let's... Well, who do you want to answer this? Because this guy gets a tabber at my place every single time. He's 75 <laughs> years old. He meets both the European guidelines. Remember, European guidelines cut it off at 75. Our say 65 to 80. We look back and forth. I'm five years away from this. You know, I, I, this guy's going to get either a 34 Evolute or a, mm -hmm. a, or a 29 S3. Either one of those is big enough to do okay. If you want to give him the, the best hemodynamics, because he's swimming five, swimming 5K a, a day, you give him a 34. He's got a high coronary. He doesn't have coronary disease. He's not going to get coronary disease during his lifetime. Coronary access is not mm -hmm. an issue. I he in, in my place, this guy's going to get a taver all day long. We would still, you know, we I, I love the model of shared decision making. So we would obviously present him with both options, talk about plus and minuses of both. But most likely, these patients end up uh, choosing taver. I agree. So the, the thing that's very interesting about this gentleman is that actually by the numbers, he doesn't meet severe aortic stenosis, uh, as, or, excuse me, he's asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. His calcium score is excessively high. But if you actually look, he actually is probably stage two, almost stage it's three almost for three. myocardial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are the types of patients that are very hard because their cardiologists often are following them because they're, all they're following is the echo numbers. Yeah. His, you know, and his, his mean gradient was in the 50s. I think he said 56. His velocity was 440. And so, um, you know, he's creeping up, but they've kind of missed the opportunity to treat him early. Yeah. So now with an EF of 55% and stage probably three dysfunction, I mean, he is not going to be someone who's going to need two valves in his lifetime. He's, his, you know, we've waited too long. Um, and so uh, he could have probably been treated, especially in some of the newer trials for earlier intervention. Um, and even though he's New York Heart Association class one and doesn't have a lot of symptoms, we definitely need to treat him now. Um, in terms of what of choice, I agree. I'm going to offer him everything. Probably I'm not going to offer him a mechanical valve, but he's going to get a large initial platform, whether it's surgical 
or transcatheter with either valve that's commercially available for low risk patients. And so I think that, you know, this man is set up well, no matter what he chooses. And again, I totally agree. Shared decision-making here is what's going to drive what he wants done with his body. Yeah, that, it's that, difficult that, to, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, sometimes it's difficult, right? We follow them and they, they really want to wait as long as they can. But you can see just on that view, the CT, the heart is dilated already. Yeah. So it's, like you said, this is a great point. Unfortunately, he waited a little too long. I, I've tried to be very proactive. I put them on a treadmill just to see anything, right? The little blunted blood pressure response, some symptoms. I try to, you know, find a reason to operate on them sooner. But sometimes, yes, we do see them coming to the community. And unfortunately, sometimes you know, in, the days when we only had, in the days when we only had surgery to offer, these were hard decisions. But now mm -hmm. we have TAVR. This isn't a hard decision. This guy's got a big left atrium marker for mortality. He's got MAC marker for mortality. He's got a bad RV marker for mortality. Mm -hmm. this, this, this guy is not as asymptomatic. Even though he's swimming, when you treat this guy, he's going to come back in a month. He's going to tell you, my God, I feel, I feel so <laughs> much better. And, and, it, and if you go look at George yeah. Drain's work out of Australia and his national echo database, what they show you is any level of aortic stenosis, even mild, takes years off your life. Yeah. And, and asymptomatic, severe, takes years off your life. It just, it just doesn't, it's not quite as bad as symptomatic. Uh, there, there was, this guy would come in and I, I, I have to, quite frankly, I wouldn't even talk about surgery with this guy. He's and it's anatomically set up. I just say, listen, dude, you, you need a tavern because that's what he's going to want anyway. <laughs> well, there was a question in the chat. There was a question in the chat. So for the two surgeons, because I have my own opinion on this, yeah. um, which I'll, I'll hold off for now. But the question in the chat was, does the AFib, because you could do a maze and left atrial appendage ligation at the at the same time as your surgical aortic valve placement. Does the AFib change your algorithm, and do you push him to surgery so you can treat his AFib at the same time? That was uh, that was I was going to discuss that. I you know here probably uh, if I see this patient, I I I'll present him both. I, I think this patient, uh, despite the, you you guys mentioned that the change of the heart the dilate of the atrium. And I think it's longevity and 10 years or beyond is reasonable. Um, I would offer him surgery, do a do a enlargement and uh, do a do a, a by atrial maze procedure and hopefully and get rid of the atrial fibrillation, excise the atrial appendage, get him off the anticoagulation. And um so that's I would offer to him. I also tell him about Tava too, but I tell him you, know, you cannot get rid of your atrial fibrillation. And um, he will do well with surgery with the, with this kind of function and status. So he'll he'll do well, but he's not he's not going to take surgery. I mean, you're going to tell him about a maze, and he'll say, "Can't they do that with a catheter?" And you have to say, "Well, they can you say yes as well." Can't they plug my pins? Well, they can, just not quite as well. I mean, you know, if this guy was seventy or younger, then then I'd be thinking more about. It. But seventy five, this guy's going to get one procedure. He's already down the pathway of of heart damage. Uh, you know, if this guy lived to be 84, I'd be surprised, quite frankly. Me too. Yeah, it's and that... to, to convince them, you know, for the me than to go for everything if they're a little bit younger. Yeah, they feel like it, it, it makes more sense, at least in my practice, that I feel it's been a better way to, you know, to have them go to surgery when you, you tell them you can get all of this fixed at the same time. As they get older, sometimes they don't, they seem not to perceive this as much as a benefit. But, you know. And if you're my age or younger, you're young. So that means at 70 and below, you're young. But it's you're getting old. <laughs> yeah. Con and yeah, about the panels, I want to ask you a question. What is the chance, uh, based on the anatomy, for him to get a valve in valve type? I say, assume he lived like another 10 years and need another valve. Well, he's, well, well, first of all, he's got sinuses that are 32 and he's got a high right yeah. coronary. So the odds of him getting a valve in valve are exceedingly high. So one of these things when we, we look at these, we do think about what's the chance of, of TAVR and TAVR. And, and we do think about coronary disease, but this guy's not going to get coronary disease during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't have it at 75, <laughs> he's not going to get it. But if you, if you look that. at the sinuses and you look at the coronaries, this guy's going to be a reasonably good setup. And particularly if you did a 29 S3 in this guy, it's going to be below the STJ, it's going to be below the coronaries. This, this guy would just rock and roll. And I, I was, um, I, I did a simulation study with the low risk uh, CT scans. So inherent in the low risk studies was a FDA mandated CT sub study. And so there are about 250 um, SAVR and 250 SAVRs in each side that were required to have CT scans 
um, at 30 days in one year. And they were looking for halt. But what they left behind was a treasure chest of things that we can look into in that CT sub-study patient set. So I took the 250 CTs from the Evolute low risk because I was, as a surgeon, terrified. What are we doing? We're putting these valves in. We're not going to be able to do a second valve. I expected 60% or less of patients would be candidates for a tab and tab or redo taver. And so we did a simulation. And if the valve, um, if you positioned the sapien valve at node three with some leaflet overhang, about 80% of patients are eligible for tab and tab. Um, and so, you know, now we have this land higher. Well, none of the valves are actually designed to be landed at zero. So if you land is as kind of the, um, the way that the manufacturer is recommending. So for an Evolute that, that's between one and five with the really the markers on the new FX are right at three. And if you do that, you should most of the time be able to do a second valve. And as mentioned, this patient has great anatomy. Now we're in the era where we should be planning the second valve when we're implanting the first valve. And we can use simulation on the native CT and say, if I put this valve in first, what can I build on it? And, and so I, I think that this guy is well set up, probably will never need a second valve, but if he does, there's lots of combinations you could use. Yeah. And just, uh, whenever I see a bad right heart like this, Mary, every time I put you on bypass, I hurt your right heart. Mm -hmm. and, and it's gonna take this guy two to six <clears throat> months to recover. So if it takes him six months to recover and he's gonna live eight more years, that's a, that's a pretty good chunk of his remaining lifespan. Again, I, 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 I wouldn't, I, I, surgery is not a bad thing for this guy, but if he's 70 or below, we, we, we'd talk to him about that. But he's not going to, and this guy's not going to choose surgery. No, nobody, I mean, even, even when I tell him the data, getting people to choose surgery is a difficult thing. And, and, but we talk to him about it. There's a lot of people, though, that I tell them that you absolutely should not have a TAVR, and those people I just send away. And there's other people I say, you'd be better off with surgery, but we can do TAVR. And when they choose TAVR, I just write the chart. I told them they should have surgery. And that way they come back in 10 years, I can point back at it from my porch because I'll be on the ranch then. <laughs> that I told you you should have had surgery. And so <laughs> talking about patients with um, younger patients that may need a second or third surgery uh, later on in their life, um, a new paper from our group that just came out, uh, first author being Dr. Hawkins, <laughs> is redo SAVR in someone who has previously had a TAVR versus a SAVR. So meaning that we will have a SAVR, SAVR versus TAVR SAVR in these patients and comparing the uh, short term outcomes of these patients. So uh, this paper was a retrospective review of the STS uh, database from 2011 to 2021. There were 48,220 patients total that had a prior aortic valve uh, procedure. And uh, we excluded anyone that uh, did not have a bioprosthetic uh, valve replacement, um, if it was an emergent explant or if the SAVR was unplanned in any way. So ended up with 29,306 patients with SAVR and 1,800 patients with TAVR. Um, so definitely uh, one of um, the limitations here is maybe the discrepancy between the uh, number of people in each group. So they actually did do a uh, propensity match at the end to compare the two as well, um, to look at operative mortality and STS uh, major morbidity. And so um, they looked at uh, the yearly rates of uh, TAVR, SAVR, and SAVR, um, TAVR, SAVR, and then also TAVR, SAVR. And uh, the number of people who have had a prior TAVR um, that then underwent a SAVR and then had a prior SAVR, TAVR, and underwent a SAVR increased over time, whereas those who only had a prior SAVR and then got a uh, reintervention with a SAVR actually remained stable over time. Compared with those who had a uh, SAVR SAVR, risk adjusted operative mortality was significantly higher for those with a uh, previous TAVR um, and not with those with a uh, previous uh, SAVR TAVR. So those with transcatheter um, procedures previously 
had higher uh, mortality and morbidity. So then it brings us to the question of what should our first approach be? And should our first, if someone is older versus younger and what the, um, the anatomy was and their comorbidities were, were should we ever ask for uh, TAVR in the first uh, procedure? So I wanted to um, start with Dr. Polin and, and ask like in these multidisciplinary um, approaches in these meetings, uh, with, if you're talking about long-term management, is there a uh, case where you would ask for a TAVR first? Um, again, we uh, we always talk about when, when we see our patients in clinic, it's a shared decision making. So we talk to them about the data that we have. If they're young, so you know, in the 65, 70 group, uh, we definitely tell them that they're more likely to need at least another valve and potentially a third one. So in their lifetime, they actually are likely to potentially need surgery, uh, depending on how things go. Um, so it's all about, you know, what's going on in their life right now, them uh, understanding the data and their anatomy. Um, the Some of the younger, you know, patients are still working. They still have very busy lifestyles. And sometimes for them, uh, it's difficult to take the time off from surgery. And I, I'm actually interested to hear from our my surgical colleagues what they think about this when, when they come encounter that patients who, have um, for them, you know, taking the time off the downtime of surgery is actually uh, either economically difficult um, or, you know, there's other social reasons for them not to do that. Um, so I'd like to see what you guys think about that. Do, do, do we uh, always tell patients if they have a native Taiwa and then they don't have a Saba and mortality, national mortality is by 11.3% on this table. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do the same thing, but I mean, when I sit down and talk to people that I think are likely to need a second procedure, one of the things I do is I look at the CT scan, because when you see a study like this from the STS, what you don't know, those that had a prior TAVR and then got surgery, did they get surgery because they couldn't have another TAVR anatomically, or they got surgery because they were so sick looking that somebody said, I can't operate on that patient. And, and there's no way to propensity match that out. You just, you just mm -hmm. can't do it. But, but the data says the hazard ratio is, is two to three times. And, and, and you and Kendra and I have all done a number of these, and they're not like just doing a redo aortic valve. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, if, if they have a small root and it, and it looks like they're, they're going to get a small TAVR valve, and then they're not going to be a good candidate for putting a smaller TAVR valve in there, and they're going to have risk of coronary obstruction, then, yeah, I tell them, you know, you're going to be a lot better off. Just let me put a biologic valve, a big biologic valve, and you make your root bigger. You know, number one, you may not ever fail if I put a big enough valve in. And number two, if you fail, you're a good setup for a second operation. So, you know, the, the, these are all things that that if you have a well-functioning heart team and a surgeon that actually understands the TAVR space too, you can sit down <clears> and talk <throat> with them about that. The, the problem I have is a lot of the surgeons really don't have a concept of the TAVR space. So it's hard for them. If they just walk in and say, you need an operation, patients just immediately turn off. <laughs> you have to start talking about why an operation would make more sense to them. And if yeah. you do that, most people will, will, will listen to you. I, I do agree, Mike. I think you know, as surgeons, we should know the, the type of field and, and have the knowledge how type has been done and the, how to set up patients for next procedure, yeah. which is about involved type. And the, the, the knowledge about the coronary height, the roots, the size of the uh, sinus, the root, the uh, the valve to coronary distance, STG, all these things that we should have a knowledge as a surgeons, especially the, our residents, the new generations of cardiac surgeons should have all this knowledge, design a lifetime management for younger people, like younger than 65 or 60. I, I think for those population and um, with with a annual enlargement to give a large, large valve, a really large valve, hopefully last Wrong, but not need the surgery, but need another procedure can be easily done with the type, uh, type of valve involved, type of maybe second valve involved, type of. Um, so yeah, I, I do agree with you. And um, really, surgeons need to do learn more about the type and uh, participate. I think one of the, one there, the big mm -hmm. that came out of the discussion of the low risk trials, particularly you know from surgeons, was that the not all sites have really well functioning heart teams, and and I think that mm -hmm. you know not not that that TAVR looks better than surgery or in low risk or this or that. It's just that in a lot of places you have a surgeon that's that's very peripherally involved, 
a decision is made mm -hmm. without real surgical input. And you know, somebody says, well, you know, low risk was 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 positive. So any base low risk, we ought to be able to treat. I have patients show up in the clinic all the time, but they've been told at age 60, well, you can have a tower because you know low risk was positive. Well, you know, that that's that's just a misconception of what we know based on data right now. And it's a bad, it's a, it's non-functioning heart team. And and I will take it one step further and also um pull in the, the chat question, which was the low risk trial data also that there's a bicuspid nested registry where they compared the TAVR results from bicuspids to those of trileaflet valves and to surgery, but there's never been a head-to-head -head study in bicuspids. So um, we have to be careful with that. So in the chat, there was, what do you do with a young patient who's a bicuspid, has a dilated ascending aorta, but it's not yet at a point where it requires replacement. And they're, let's say they're in their late forties. Let's make them, you know, let's make this a really hard situation. Well, um, you know, Mike Reardon, have, I have talked about this. He's heard me present it. I had this very patient come to clinic oh. and he's a veterinarian and he'd done his research and he had looked up every study that I was going to quote and he already knew the data. And he said, look, what I want is I want a TAVR now. And when I retire, when I'm 65, I want my sternotomy then. And I can't tell him it's wrong. I can tell him that his risk at 65 of me taking out a TAVR valve is higher than his risk of surgery today. That I know to be true. I can never get him back to his low risk surgical risk that he is pre anything. And I can tell him that his risk of death from a surgical valve replacement, if we did a SAVR first that then failed, because he's absolutely not going to take Coumadin. He's a large animal veterinarian. So if I put a biologic valve in him, it's not going to last either. And so if I'm going to take that out and put a, a mechanical valve in when he's in his 50s or 60s, that risk is going to be lower than taking out a TAVR valve based on what we know today. But I also know if you look at the trends that the removal of the TAVR valves, those risks are going down. A lot of the data that we have was in concomitant valve disease. They had mitral pathology at the same time, they had endocarditis. And so you were, yeah, you were moved to TAVR valve, but you were doing a bunch of other things in high risk patients to begin with. And unfortunately the data is what it is. And I still counsel that patient. Do I tell him I will absolutely not do that? I don't tell them that, but I help counsel them so they can take responsibility for if that valve only lasts five, six, seven years, we're like, well, we gave it a, we gave it a go and now we got to take it out. Um, and so there are on 900 sites. If I tell him, no, he's going to go down the street. And that's not ever the right reason to do the wrong thing, but to counsel your patient about the data we have available today and make shared decision-making the priority. He also needs to know his insurance company is not going to pay for it. So if he wants to pay out of pocket because the insurance company is going to deny a tavern and, and all of those other things, he's willing to take the responsibility for the unknowns. I'm going to be willing to treat him however he wishes. Loss operation. <laughs> I know that's I'm, what he needed, but I know my time with Ross operation. But it, it needs a Ross, but but you know, for surgeons that don't do the Ross, you you have to you have to have enough ethics that you refer them to somebody that does Ross all the time. You know, the the thing that the Ross has started back in the '90s, and everybody got excited, and I had people coming in to see me that were seen out in the periphery with surgeons I knew were doing eight a year quoting a 1% Ross mortality. And I knew they hadn't done a Ross in their lifetime. And, and so, you know, the Ross would be perfect for these young people, but you know, you, you need to be at some place where there's somebody that does Rosses. You know, everybody claims to be a Ross surgeon. Everybody claims to be a mitral valve repair surgeon. That's a lie on both parts. Yeah. So, and uh, you know, this patient 44 years old, right? And if you look at the, the, the data here showed that the 11.3% Tava-Saba mortality is actually isolated Saba after Tava. It's not the concomitant operations. It's still much mm -hmm. higher. I, I do agree. Once we get better with 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 Tava, and uh, it'd be it'd be uh, easier, and the problem mortality will be lower. And uh, but it's high. It is the high uh, risk operation now uh, for most of surgeons. That's number one. Number two. Yeah, I, I do agree. You Knowing the, the Ross centers, the, the Ross outcomes are very good. Yeah. Uh, however, you know, and um, I mean, all the data Ross compared, I always mentioned that is compared to a bioprosthetic valve with the 
size 21, 23, those yeah. patients, we, don't, we know they don't do well, as, as you showed in the Avaru trial. I mean, they, they just they continue to die because the, the valve is so small. We do not have a, a large cohort of population treated with the you know, valve 27, 29. So um, this is unknown. Does it make any difference? And from our data, our institution, the more than 2,000 patients, size 29 valve patients do much better than then 20 through 27 or 20, 19 to 21 uh, after you know, uh, preferences school match and the multivariable analysis. So uh, I still don't know uh, ROS is better or, or a, a um, valve uh, with a large valve and, and bioprosthetic valve later on with the Taiwa because the ROS always have an issue with the right side. Everything bad for the left side will happen to the right, to the right side of, of in the ROS patient. Yeah. Well, all I say is if this guy was one of my kids, he'd be my middle child, which then makes that, from my perspective, that makes him really young. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I never had a son. He could be the son I never had. But, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's a really young person. And, and you know, a, a biologic valve, no matter how big we put it in, a 44-year-old, it's going to be a problem just because of the age. Yeah, and, I do. Agree. It's going to fail the, faster. Yeah. I mean, it, it, they're, 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 they're valve-related things for for. Failure and there's patient metabolic things related for failure and age is a, is a big issue. I would have a hard time, not not that I'd tell him no, but I have a hard time putting in a biologic valve in a 44 year old. Um, now, you know, I, I when you do tavern younger people, I did have a guy in his early 60s come to me with symptomatic severe AS, mean gradient somewhere in the high 50s. His wife had just been diagnosed with brain cancer. He was told his wife was going to live for six months. And, and he, his only idea was he wanted to be able to physically take care of his wife. You know, we tavered the guy. He knows he's going to come back. He's a healthy guy. But his, his whole goal was to take care. So there's always these weird things that come up that you have to make individual decisions based on the patients you see. I, yeah, I do agree, Mike. And another thing is we didn't discuss the mechanical valve here, right? And, the, and the, if we really need discuss with the patient a mechanical valve, you know, and uh, with um, as a large mechanical valve. We, I'll, I'll mention this before, you know, in a dual camera study compared the David procedure to mechanical valve AVR in my fans patient, those patients all have large annulus. And I talked to him privately. He said he, he put 27, the largest mechanical valve, those patients the most time. And the survival between the David procedure and the bento, mechanical bento was a large valve. It's the same. There's no significant. It's the same. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that's what we're saying. If if we will have large large mechanical valve, large prosthetic valve, it could it could change the the curve of the uh, prosthetic valve performance. So I have a picture on my oh. wall though from a guy who, in in uh, August of 1985, my second month in private in practice, I put a mechanical St. Jude in him, and he died three years ago. Now, mm -hmm. Not from a bad valve, because he just got into his 90s. He never had any issue with the valve. So these valves get a bad rap, you know, and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, particularly younger people, uh, you know, that can get on self-testing do very, very well with mechanical valve. I, mm -hmm. I think they I think they have a, you know, this rat poison stuff is just unfortunately overplayed. Yeah. You know, I, the patients well, are coming but, in. But what do you go ahead? I was just going to say, patients are coming in so much more informed yeah. uh, about all of these options. And so, you know, having a really strong heart team approach and unfortunately taking the time to go through all of these options and all of the different iterations, you know, uh, I have patients come in and say, I want a Ross and I send them over to Shinichi. You know, they say, I want an Onyx. I don't want a St. Jude. I want an Onyx valve. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So, and you go over the data that they want to talk about. And these, these conversations are so difficult because they have to be so personalized, just like you said. But I, I will say that, you know, they're part of the problem is the lack of data. You know, the projections in this study, I think actually underestimate the numbers that are occurring right now. And uh, I think the the numbers are essentially doubling every year in the STS database in terms of TAVR explants. So I do think hopefully in the next two, three years, we get a lot more data because it's all about the anatomy. Yeah. It's, you know, th there's obviously concomitant, you know, disease adds risk, but I, you know, this detail about the anatomy is so important. Uh, you know, we are modeling and we're trying to figure out who's a valve and valve, 
or a Tav and Tav candidate who isn't. And we're doing it so much that you're starting to get a sense and being able to do sort of the mental math in your head. You know, this is a, this is a good Tav and Tav. This is not. And then when it's not doing the models uh, up front so you can have these conversations. But, you know, for example, at the VA, a bunch of these quote unquote young patients who are 60, 62 years old, you know, their goal is to live one more year. Yeah. You know, it, it, everyone's different and you got to tailor the conversation to the patient. Well, I think the other thing, Robert, is, is if you find surgeons that do their own prementios, they have a much better concept of what you can do in the future. I mean, I do all my own prementios and, and when my, I have a surgical fellow over here that's my structural fellow. You're not allowed to do tabbers, so you can show me you can do a trementio. Tell mm -hmm. me what valve you want to choose and why you want to choose that valve. And, and if okay. you're just counting on industry and you're not doing it yourself, you're never going to get this pattern recognition. I mean, I, I guarantee you that Kendra and Bo do these. Yeah. And I, I can just look at it and say, oh, okay, this one's going to be good. This one's going to be bad. And then there's some that are kind of in the middle that you almost really need the model. But most of them are, are, are pretty obvious one way or the other. And so I, I think the one of the, one of the issues is that we need we still need surgeons to be involved. And I don't mean just involved in, in planning. The valve is the easiest thing. I mean yeah. putting in the putting in a safety valve. I can take my daughters into the operating room and have them hold this and put a valve in. You know that's not being a valve implanter. Being able to yeah. to, to make the decisions and do the three minutes. You look at the imaging. Those are the those are the keys for the for the surgeons at least. Actually, it's the keys for the whole heart team. Mm -hmm. And I got to say that we're getting, you know, better and better at Tever, right? We're more conscious about thinking about the second valve, so the implant that, yeah. coronary access, um, you know, leave, um, commissure alignment and all of this, right? So we're thinking about the future valve and there's newer technology also happening, right? We have the lethal laceration. There's some technologies coming in that are looking at removing the leaf that's all together. So there, I think we'll get also better at valve and valve, which hopefully is going to help with this. I don't know if it's going to help with this data because probably the cases that are going to go to surgery are going to be the more complex one. But um, hopefully there's some things down the line that are going to help the field. Well, all the Saver explant tavers right now are done by my residents with me helping. So I'm not so I'm not so interested in can I do it? Can Bo do it? You know, can Andrew do it? I'm interested in can we teach this? And, mm -hmm. you know, and so every one of these is done by one of my residents. And every time I learn something, oh, they weren't thinking about this. Here's what we need to make sure people focus on. Because this needs to be a teachable thing, not just a doable thing, but a teachable thing. Mm -hmm. Besides, I'm pretty old. I get tired easily. So that's easier things to do. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree in that. There are so many nuances to these types of conversations. And um, I think what makes a good... Uh, physician in general is being able to have those conversations with your patient and tailor it to each one. And so this was such an amazing uh, discussion, but it is two minutes past the 8 p.m. mark. So I wanted to be um, cognizant of everyone's time and just say thank you so much for uh, the great discussion tonight and for joining us. Yeah, Mike Bo, I'm on to my next meeting. So 